Shalom everyone, and today we're going to uh, study Parashat Miketz, Happy Hanukkah, because Parashat Miketz always coincide with Hanukkah. What is the connection? Uh, the word is Miketz. Miketz means to bring, it's like at the end, but in Hebrew it's like not just the end, it's kind of a determination of to term, terminate something. So what does it mean? The story is, uh, we're talking in uh, the book of Genesis, Bereshit, chapter 41, verse 1, two years later, and Pharaoh is dreaming. What's the story? We just read yesterday, uh, the, the story about Joseph in jail, how the how you know the whole story about Joseph dreams, his brothers they think he's a bad guy, they sell him because of that, they want to kill him, they almost make it. Still, they sell him as a slave. He arrives to Egypt and he has tough life over there. Finally, he finds himself in jail. Okay, 12 years in jail, Egyptian jail. It's not more than jail of today, what they call correctional facility jail okay and he's there 12 not so easy years because he can't have it uh, nice in jail still something is very special over there because the question is what's the message for us and now it's connected to Hanukkah and especially in our days okay so 12 years Joseph is in jail and we learn that he's in jail because he refused to sleep with his master's uh, wife. He did not want to betray his master. He did not want to betray his upbringing. Uh, and he did something a slave is not supposed to do, not a slave in Egypt and not anywhere. He basically goes against the will of his uh, master's wife. She owns him. She can do with him whatever she wants. Uh, Still, we are talking about Joseph, that he's on the peak, on the road of what he thought is the road, as a Hebrew slave in Egypt, at the end of Parashat Vayeshev, he's uh, running the business of Potiphar, one of the most powerful uh, people in Egypt. And still, he doesn't realize there's a bigger future waiting for him. So, finds himself in jail, as we said, because the wife of Potiphar blames him for trying to rape her. Potiphar knows that she's lying, but, you know, a, a wife and a husband many times can't say uh, to your wife, you're lying. And that's what happens. So he sends him to jail. He doesn't kill him, Potiphar. But then in jail, 10 years later, Joseph meets the wine steward and the baker, Pharaoh's baker. And they had a, a dream. And the way Joseph interpreted the dream, and that's what's important for us, Joseph is telling the wine steward that within three years, three days, Pharaoh is going to take him out of jail and put him back to his seat, to his position. And he tells the baker, within three days, Pharaoh is going to hang you. And the uh, birds of the heavens of the sky are going to eat your flesh over your, uh, from, your, from your bones. Uh, and then Joseph is saying something very, that it's normal. He tells the wine steward, when you get out from here and you get back your freedom, you go back to freedom, remember me and remind me over there in, to Pharaoh that I'm here no, I, of no shame. I, I, I was blamed for nothing, okay? And for two years, for two years, the wine steward forgets till Pharaoh's dream. And that's how we start. Uh, chapter 41, verse one, it is a dream, two dreams. Pharaoh is dreaming his famous dreams about the seven fat cows that are being eaten up by the seven lean cows and the seven fat uh, ears of wheat that are being 
blow, uh, swallowed up by the seven lean ones. Okay. And he wakes up in the morning. He has no idea what's happening, but he's very, very upset. He knows he got a really Im an important message. And all his wizards cannot give him a satisfying um, interpretation to his dream. Only then, the wine steward remembers Joseph. That's a story, okay? And he tells Pharaoh, there's this guy, a Hebrew slave in the in dungeon that he knew exactly how to interpret our dreams. And then comes the magical verse that our study is going to uh, be mostly about it. Uh, and you can find it Okay. In Genesis chapter 41, verse 14, and Pharaoh sent to call Joseph from the, the pit. And they rushed him from the pit. They washed him, they shaved him, they gave him a haircut and they changed his clothes and he's coming and standing in front of Pharaoh. He's interpreting, Pharaoh tells him, just think about it. Just a few minutes ago, he woke up in the pit of the pit, in the lowest of the lowest. He's a Hebrew slave in Egypt, in the dungeon, in the pit. And now he's standing in front of Pharaoh and Pharaoh is asking him to do him a favor and interpret his dreams. The result of his interpretation is known to all that he tells Pharaoh about the seven years of plenty coming and after that seven years of famine and what should be done. And Pharaoh chooses him to be the CEO of the Egyptian empire. And that's it, the whole story turns around overnight success. So the question is like this, what's going on uh, in Joseph's life that we can relate to and how whatever is happening over there is a message to us, especially nowadays and especially in Hanukkah. That's a ba the basic issue. <coughs> <coughs> And we will start in Parashat Miketz in the Zohar, verse one in the Zohar Perusha Sulam, in Rabbi Ashlag's uh, commentary, but we read first in the original uh, text of uh, the Zohar in Aramaic. Vayi Miketz, Rabbi Chia patach v'amar, Ketz sam l'choshech u'lechol t'chlit u'chokher, even ofel v'tzalmavet. Hai kai t'mar, Ketz sam לחושך. די הוא קץ לשמאלה, והוא שט בעלמה, ושט לעילה, וקיימה כמי קודשיו ריחו. ואסתי וקטרג על עלמה. והיית מר ולכל תכלית וחוקר. והכל עובדוי, לאו אינון לטב, אלא לשצאה תדיר ולמאבד כליה בעלמה. This is the key sentence of what the story is about. And the story is like this, I'm translating. Rabbi Chia, one of the major students of Rabbi Shimon and colleagues, basically, student and co a colleague, is quoting about Vayi Miketz, the word Miketz, and it was a determination of the two years, okay? And the word is termination, to terminate, to finish, to finish, which means to, to bring to an end, to a demise. Okay, and he's bringing a verse from the book of Job, chapter 28, verse 3. Ketz sam lachoshech, that the creator brings the demise to the end, to the determination for darkness. Okay, there are many, many, the Zohar says there are many commentaries to this verse. However, for this parasha, when it speaks about 
terminating darkness. This is the end of the left column. A left column that is not included, that is not bound by the right column. What is that? The left column that is not bound by the right column is called the angel of death. And in a simple language, left column means the desire to receive for the self alone. The desire to receive, which means it's like in electricity, in order to have any circuitry, you need the minus. However, when we have the minus only, uh, you don't have a circuitry. You don't have anything coming out. But in a human being, there is. When a person is super selfish, which means only the left column is active, which means he is egotistic, and it's only about me and supplying, fulfilling my immediate desires and needs. That's called the left column that is not bound by the right column. What does it mean, right left column that is bound by the right column? We learn about it when we studied about the binding of Isaac, Parashat Vayera. And what does it mean? It means when a person is trying to do his journey, he has two forces. One force is the left column, I need, I desire, which is, you know, we are born with that. We're supposed to have that. But in order to kosher the left column, because as we said, the left column without the right column is the angel of death. Why the angel of death? Because the Zohar explains the source of life is the light of the creator. That's a source of life. You want to connect to the source of life, there is the rule of affinity. And the, roles, the rule of affinity speaks about that equalities, they have an attraction. It's a law of attraction. So you want to connect to the endless life force of the creator, you have to vibrate on the same wavelength. And that means you have to be generous, you have to be loving, you have to be caring, because, and that is called the right God. However, we're human beings. We're not the creator. We cannot be just the right column. We cannot be just loving, caring, and giving creatures. We need to activate the left column also because if I don't receive, I cannot give. You cannot have the, any electric device activated and work only with a minus. You need a plus. Same thing, we humans, we need to share, to care, and to love in order to align ourselves and connect to the source of life. However, in order to be able to give, you need to be able to receive. So that's why when you kosher your desire to receive, how do you kosher it? When you say, as we learn about the binding of Isaac, I, I want, I need, I desire, I wish I have, okay, whatever, but in one condition, that if I want to be happy, it's in one condition that I make other people happy also, not just me, okay? Because if it's only me, it's a desire to receive selfishly, that's the left column, and that's death, because it cannot have any connection to the life force of the creator. The end of life, the only way you can attach to it or connect to it is by being in affinity with it, which means you have to vibrate with love, compassion, and creativity and positivity in order to connect to the light, the endless light of the creator. And that is the real hard work. The point is, it's not that simple. It's just got very complicated the moment we are born into a physical body. Because what's the physical body about? Physical body is about, you know, if you listen to your body, emotions and thoughts, is about the instant gratification. And it's a very childish thing. You know, when you're a kid, you know, 
you know, you kids are very selfish. It's like they want it and they want it now. Any kind of self gratification. I want the chocolate now. I want the ice cream now. I want the game now. And I don't care and I don't want to hear about any limitations. As we grow up, we learn that we have to subdue the body desires. We need to communicate. You can't just take whatever you see and you desire, right? You can't just get money without giving service. You cannot get love without being sensitive to other people's needs and desires. So it's a, it becomes a trade, okay? But when we listen to the body needs, if we just eat whatever you feel like, we'll kill ourselves. If we just sleep with whoever we want to at the moment we want to, it's like, it's a mess. If you just say whatever you feel like saying and you hurt whenever you want to hurt somebody, it's a mess. We know that we have that side, which is the physical lower being of our consciousness. It's the bodily needs. And for the moment we let that take over, the mess and the chaos will just be uh, whatever we're going to experience during our lives. So you can have the most amazing uh, talented people and history shows it again and again. And those people, they fall because of what? Hebrews, because of selfishness, because of I want it and I want it now. And who cares about the bigger picture that our body needs and desires, they motivate us to have a kind of fulfillment and gratification, but it doesn't serve the bigger picture about who do we want to become? What kind of a life do we want to have? What kind of an atmosphere and energy we want to generate around ourselves? And the moment that selfishness and the needs of the body uh, takes over, it never ends well. Why is that so important? Let's go to Hanukkah. Hanukkah, we're talking about some more than 2,000 years ago, 2,200 years ago, less than that. We're having a big clash between two civilizations. One civilization is the Hellenistic civilization. It's the civilization that since Alexander the Great, a few centuries earlier, it's a, the ruling civilization from Greece all the way uh, to Persia and Egypt, like all the, all the Middle East is being run, almost all of it, by the Hellenistic civilization. However, inside the Hellenistic civilization, there are big Jewish communities. They, you can find them all over in uh, Asia Minor, in Egypt, in uh, Israel and Syria, in uh, Mesopotamia, and everywhere. You can find big Jewish communities. And the Jewish communities, they live as enclaves of people that have believed totally in something that is opposite to the Hellenistic uh, civilization. And uh, what was the Hellenistic civilization based on? It was a Greek a religion and philosophy, and they admired basically whatever we spoke about that is materialism, instant gratification, the body and the body. They adored the physical body. They adored the physical mind, the intellect, the beauty that the human being can create, which means it was a very materialistic, super, super physical and egocentric materialistic civilization. How did they do that? It was also, uh, you know, people of today say, oh, the, the Hellenistic civilization was an amazing, uh, glamorous civilization, but just think about it. When we're talking about the great time of Athens with the great philosophers at Athens, that's a few centuries earlier, right? that we have uh, Aristotle, we have Plato, we have all of these great uh, 
writers and poets and philosophers. They were, and they speak about democracy. At that time in Athens, there were a few hundred rich people that they had democracy just among them. Most of, the, no, most of the people living in Athens were slaves with no human rights whatsoever. And basically, if we look at Athens the way we see today, it's illegal. It's illegal. That was based, Athens was based on total exploitation. There was an elite, a uh, very, very thin elite that is exploiting the rest of the people. And they had time to be, to have philosophy and all of these pleasures because there were so many slaves working for them without any rights. And their opinions, of course, haven't been heard. Okay, this is Athens. And that was exactly the base of the Hellenistic uh, civilization. While in the Jewish civilization, that lived parallel to the Greek one was exactly the opposite, which means uh, slavery was not that appreciated. Most of the Jews were middle-class kind of people, innovators, business people, uh, farmers, very little slavery and very little high-class people that ran the story. The people had uh, opinions and they made the opinions heard. There was a lot of democracy, a lot of, we're talking about totally two different kinds of uh, civilizations. By the way, if you look at our civilization today, and then we can see still the fight. On one hand, we have the Hellenistic civilization still running supreme because in our world, we see a tendency uh, to come back to the way it used to be before World War, uh, World, uh, World War I. Europe before World War I was mostly monarchies, very rich people. They had the, the, the say, they, were, they had the clique, the House of Lords and so on and so on, like, like the nobility. They had the right, the access to education, they were controlling the government, they were controlling the army, they're controlling the industry. Most of the people were basically slaves. Yeah, they had some, uh, some rights, but really they were slaves. And in our reality, it's uh, like 70, 80 years after World War II, and we're coming back to the same place. We start to realize that most of us are slaves, we have to be slaves to the big corporations, the bank system. We don't have a say, okay? And the most important thing, like in Hellenism, we live in a generation that adores the body. We have temples for the body, it's called gyms, okay? Olympic games. We're trying to revive the ancient Hellenism by simply worshiping. Our bodies and our idols are people that live with, with fame, money, and we want to be like them. Okay? But this is what the Zohar says this is darkness. When you exploit other people, when you're selfish, when it's all about how do I get the, the, an extreme excitement that is based about the desire to receive for the self alone. Yeah, but I work for it. It's my money. Doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You want to connect to true happiness, light, and true fulfillment and lasting fulfillment. You must, you must put yourself into the commitment that the body cannot control you. You cannot just accumulate wealth, power, any kind of pleasure, bodily pleasures and still be able to keep happy. You cannot. It's against the rules of the universe. So we are talking about, the question is, why is it 
you know, the question each one of us is asking, why is it that I'm not happy? Why I'm not feeling fulfilled? What's missing in my life? Why am I depressed? Why do I feel like a loser? Why do I feel that, you know, everybody say that I'm a success story. I don't feel like this. And what if I, people don't think, think I'm a success story and I feel, think the same, the same too, okay? What's the secret of really true success? And the answer is, as the Zohar says, you have to bring a, 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 an end to terminate the left column, the angel of death. And if you cannot do that, you are being ruled by, it doesn't matter if it's a boss, if it's a spouse that doesn't understand you, it's a, uh, your, uh, your, uh, uh, your society does not understand you, or doesn't matter, you don't, you simply can't find yourself. Although you have a lot of money and you can spend it on precious stuff and you still need antidepressants. What's wrong with me? What's wrong? The moment we are submitting ourselves to the religion of worshiping only our body and our selfish needs, we are belong to the religion of what is called materialism. It's not a new invention. The Greeks, the ancient Greeks, they lived like this. Okay? They created an amazing, great, beautiful civilization, but it was only a hoax. All of the beauty we, we hear about the Greek, the Hellenistic uh, civilization, it was all based on work of exploitation of the slave and it was a slave system. No rights to the majority, very small elite that basically exploited everybody else. And when the Hellenistic empire tried to subjugate the Jews to the same kind of thinking, you know, the Jews were, if you see even today, many of them, they liked the idea because they could compete because most Jews knew how to read and write since they were little kids. Most of them were really educated. So you're going into a society that is based on uh, uh, competition, you can achieve a lot. And they did. So a lot of them became Hellenistic. They were Hellenized. Because, and they followed the rules of Hellenism. They became Hellenistic citizens of the Greek policies, which means the societies in every city, including Jerusalem. They went to the gym, they went to the theater, they went to, uh, to see uh, gladiators and all of this stuff. Okay, reality shows. And they thought it's like, you know, it's okay. What can we do? It's like Judaism is too spiritual. What can I do? And they were the ones who said, but if I cannot, terminate my physical selfishness, inclination, or what we call the evil inclination, you know, I'm going to be just in the darkness for the rest of my life and I don't care for that. I'm willing to give up whatever physical comfort I have in order to achieve the spiritual true greatness. Joseph, let's go back to Joseph. Joseph, he could choose. He could choose to just go with the inclination of his body. His hormones were rushing. That's how the sages tell us. He wanted to sleep with his master's wife. He felt she was the most beautiful, sexy woman walking on earth at that time. He was also, you know, he was in the age, he was in his early 20s. And you know, he could have all the excuses. She can kill me if I said no. And he ran away from her bed. He knew she's going to be terribly angry about it and humiliated. And she's blaming for that. And she's going to take a revenge because his rejection. And he didn't care for that. He cared more for his values. Although his body was really rushing. The hormones were gushing, his, his blood was 
he was very, that's how the sages speak about that, he didn't invent it, okay? Why, why do we have to understand it? Because we have to relate to it and we all know those moments that we really want something so much that has a very strong physical uh, uh, gratification, joy, okay, in it. The problem is we know that in the bigger picture, it's, it's our demise. It doesn't fit the picture. And therefore, Joseph gave all up. He knew this is the end of his success story. And he was lucky not to be executed at that moment because, you know, a slave wants to uh, uh, rape uh, <laughs> a nobility, the wife of Potiphar, that's death, death sentence. Why was he sent to jail? Because Potiphar knew. He made the research, he realized that she was lying. That Joseph did not try to rape her, okay? So he loved him. He loved Joseph and he put him in jail instead of execution. Why Joseph is not upset about it? He is in a way, you know, you can't be really excited and happy about your life when you're stuck in a jail for 10 years, 12 years. Still, he didn't have any uh, bitterness about it because he know that's a payment that he has to pay for the dream that he has, okay? And therefore, the, the Zora and other commentators are saying, the moment that Joseph, after 10 years in jail, okay, the moment he was asking for the help of the wine steward. And that moment he realized he's not ready yet. Why? Was it wrong for him to ask for help? No, it was not wrong. It was not wrong. However, let's see what the Zoe is saying. When we are talking, and then uh, we're jumping there right now to the Zoe verse 32, which is trying to explain the verse that we wrote, read that how, because by the order of Pharaoh, Joseph was rushed out of the pit. He was showered, uh, shaved. He had a haircut. He was dressed up with clean, uh, with clean uh, uh, clothes, and he was brought in front of Pharaoh. Okay, and let's see what the Zohar is saying. It's ver verse 32 in the Zohar of Parashat Miketz. וישלח פרעה ויקרא את יוסף ויריצו מן הבור. רבי אבא פתח ואמר, רוצה אדוני את יראה ואת ימחלים לחסרו. כמה קודשה ברוך הוא יתראה באו בצדיקיה, בגין דצדיקיה, אינון עבדין שלמה לעילה. ועבדי שלמה לטטה, ועלין כלה בבעליו, בגין כך קודשה ברוך הוא יתראה באו, ואינון לדחלין להם ועבדין רעותי. So, the introduction is, רבי אבא יסא. Uh, he's quoting from um, it's not clear where it's from some somewhere. Okay, and it says Rotse Hashem The word is that God wants his followers. You know, in a simple way to explain it. What does it mean he wants them? And there's a game of words that, the, that this game is very intricate, very important to understand. Okay? And it says, How much the creator wants the righteous. Why? Because the righteous, they make peace between above and below. They bring the bride to her husband, the groom. What are we talking about? So we have to understand. What the Zohar is saying is that the world is divided into two poles. One pole is the creation. And we, we are part of the creation. We are, the creation is the female aspect of the universe. The creation is the female. That's why it's all about receiving. We are, here, we are here all about receiving. Receiving what? God's light. 
the endless light of God needs, in a way, a place to flow into. And we were created as creatures of receiving. So there is a place for that light to flow into. We are the vessel, we are the female aspect, okay? And when we want to communicate with the heavenly forces, that is the heavenly light, which is the male aspect of the creation, okay? So the more selfish we become, the more we are focused on how much I want, and I care about nothing, just give it to me, the more, as we said, according to the law of affinity, the more we drift far and farther away from the heavens, from the light of the creator. So what we do it by that, the Kabbalists call it separation between the bride creation and the groom, the, create, the light of the creator. By what? Being materialistic, focusing only on the physical needs, only body needs, only selfishly just about ourselves, we separate between the bride and the groom. But who are the righteous? The righteous people are people, not just that they're always about giving and giving that like, you know, like uh, in some religions, if you are spiritual, it means that you have no money, you have no physical uh, uh, needs. It's all about, I'm here just to give, not in Judaism, read the, the five books of Moses. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they were, they were fighting the fight of career, making money, making possessions, but they did it all with the consciousness that I need on one hand to complete my physical life of building a life, a family, a career, and stuff like this. At the same time, bringing in the spiritual values by doing that, that on one hand, you work on perfecting your physical life. On the other hand, you're trying to inject spirituality in everything you do. It has to be with light, with light. It has to be with love. It has to be with passion, but passion for bringing in the, the supernal light into the physical actions. That's called bringing peace between heaven and earth or mating the bride and the groom. Who can do it? Only a human being. Other animals have no capacity to do that. This is the only purpose of our reality. So you understand why the Maccabees, when they realize that the imperialistic, colonialistic uh, uh, Greeks or Greek civilization trying to occupy their country and their civilization, their lifestyle, by simply denying from them any kind of spiritual life. It's all about physicality, okay? There's nothing divine. It's all, and whatever is divine, you know, if you know some Greek mythology, the gods of the Greek mythology is bad news. They're selfish. They're not so smart. They're full of all the hybrids, ego, and selfishness, and the greed that a, a terrible human being could have. Those were the gods of the, of the Hellenistic uh, civilization, nothing that you want to be part of. And the Jews and the, the Greeks did not understand, how come you have a god that is invisible? Yes, he is invisible, but he's everywhere in everything. He, you don't, you can't run away from him. And the worship of this God is in every action. There was so much of a difference between the Greek philosophy and Jewish uh, spirituality. So different. That you have to sanctify everything physical because you bring the soul into the body. The Greeks could not get it. But when the Jews found out that they cannot continue doing what they were doing, they were willing to give everything up. They were willing to fight for it because they had nothing to lose. Living a very materialistic, selfish life that only adores the superficial, 
basically our lifestyle. It's worth, it doesn't worth living. So either I can fight for my real life, and if I die, no, who cares? It doesn't worth it. So go back to Joseph. When Joseph realizes that after 10 years in jail, that he was doing an extremely intense spiritual work about himself to become the person that is that can deserve to be a chariot for Sfirat Yeso, a righteous person, which means that really understands that whatever is happening to us, it just to give us an opportunity to, to wed, to unite, to bring together the soul and the body, the heavenly light and the physical reality. Nothing excludes that, okay? Everything includes in that. But at that moment, he was asking for the favors of the wine steward. Joseph said, I'm not ready. I'm still, I'm still thinking that there's the light, the endless light is not who runs this universe, but it's like the physical reality. I'm not ready yet. And he prayed for two more years to bring a demise to his state of mind of materialism. Because whoever runs the show is the light. And the moment Joseph was ready, he knew he was ready. The night before, uh, that, that night that Pharaoh had his dreams. And that night, when Joseph, inside himself, brought a total demise, termination to his own selfish thinking, he reached that place of total connection to the light of the creator. In that moment, he knew, now the darkness in my life is over. The road is open. And morning came and he was rushed out of the pit. And within a few hours, he was the most powerful person living on earth at that generation. How did that happen? So we'll read the Zohar and the Zohar will explain it and how that uh, applies to each one of us. He says, uh, we continue that psalm that says, Hashem et irav, God wants his followers, etam yachalim lechasod, the ones who yearn for his chesed, to his loving kindness. What does that mean? Me and Michalim, who are the ones who are yearning, waiting, anticipating his chesed? And he answers, Hoy Omer, Eve Omer, Elo Skim Batura Balaila. We are talking about those who, who occupy themselves with the Torah when it is nighttime. And they do it to participate with the Shekhinah, with a divine presence. And when the morning comes, and when the morning comes, they just wait for his uh, loving kindness. And what does that mean? On one hand, it means, you know, there's one very uh, ancient tradition among Kabbalists for thousands of years that you should wake up in the middle of the night and study Zohar and study spirituality. Why? Because when you do that, you awaken a thread of chesed, energy of loving kindness, light, light of love that will dwell on you when morning comes. But this is, there's two meanings to that. One that physically, yes, uh, you, when you wake up in the middle of the night, it's a very good time to get up, study Zohar, occupy yourself with that, and you will feel like you're surrounded with clouds of loving kindness through the whole day long, if you do that. And that's, that's one thing. But the other thing is like, there's a bigger explanation. What does it mean nighttime? Nighttime? Joseph being in jail for 12 years, that was nighttime. We all have moments and days 
and years of nighttime, troubles, sickness, you just name it, that we go through it, that's called nighttime. And what, is, what you should you do when it's nighttime, when you're persecuted, when you're oppressed, when you feel that you can't find a way out of your slavery to your uh, addictions, to, to other people, to what other people say, how they control your life, the big boss, the government, you know, let's say you're living in a dictatorship and there's no justice. You know, there's so many places in our lives we can call this is nighttime, okay? What should you do when you are feeling that you're at night? You should be busy with studying Torah, occupying yourself with Torah. What does it mean? With the spirituality in order to generate chesed, grace. You should occupy yourself with that, focus on that. Why? Because when you bring the consciousness of loving kindness to the world, even though you have all the justifications to be mourning, to be upset, to be uh, uh, depressed because there's no justice and because you're being, uh, you know, there's so many stories we can tell ourselves. And we know the stories in our lives. We're being deprived, we're being uh, um, uh, stepped on, we're being uh, uh, you just, there was so much stuff you can say that I have an excuse to feel bad. I'm a victim, okay? And the world is a terrible place, and why should I, and so on and so on. But if you continue during the nighttime, during the times of darkness, mental darkness, if you continue to be busy with connecting to the light of the creator, and you continue to think that there's only one force that runs the show, and that's the force of the light of God. And it says, let there be light, and everything is made of that light. That's bringing the light of chesed when it is nighttime. So yes, logically, philosophically, you think about it, you are a victim. You're being wronged, okay? Bad people, bad stuff happened, and you're just a victim. That's a nighttime. Normally, logically, philosophically, Greek philosophy, you should be upset. Why? Because it's normal, it's logic. Okay? You should hate your status. But spiritually, we're not here to have it easy. We're not here to have it nice. We're here to turn the darkness into light, to turn the evil into, into uh, mercy. We are here to turn the bitterness into sweet. And therefore, the moment I experience night, whatever aspect, if it's a physical health-wise issue, relationship issue, uh, career issue, sustenance issue, doesn't matter, social. This is a nighttime. Now, now it's the time to occupy yourself with bringing in unconditional love, positivity, state of health and wealth, I'm sorry, spiritual wealth. What does it mean? That unconditional love to others, to yourself and to the universe. When you do that, that means that you're studying, that you occupy yourself with the Torah while it is nighttime. What will happen? Because the moment you reach, like Joseph, the moment that you reach a master room, mastering the night time, that the night is not controlling you anymore, that the light that you bring to your life is stronger than the circumstances, that your happiness is unconditional and your love is unconditional to the creator, to the creation, to the creatures, without being controlled by any darkness or materialistic limitation. When you do that, you become that person that is uniting the heaven and the earth together. You become another Joseph. You become another high priest that can bring 
the light by lighting the Hanukkah can bring just light a candle and think that by this candle, I'm drawing the endless light from the upper worlds. And when I bring it down, when I light the candle down below in my home, and I light it to shine light into everything that is physical, that everything that is materialistic, that everything that has no logic, that is injustice. And with that power, I am controlling my life. Okay? What does it mean I control my life? I control my life that the, the, the endless light of the creator is everywhere. That's my control. And what happens at that moment? When it says, it says, the Zohar is saying, the word is a very special word that understanding that word is so hard. Because on one hand, Rotze means desire. God desires his followers. Does he have a desire? Because we experience desire as a lack. You know, when do I desire something? When I don't have it. I desire food when I'm hungry. I desire affection when I'm hungry for affection and warmth. I desire for knowledge when I'm hungry for knowledge. When I feel that I don't have enough knowledge. That's desire means a lack. But that's what the Zohar is saying. When you read, when it says, the word has two meanings, two different ways of understanding. One, what does it say? They rushed him out. When do you rush somebody else? I want it, we need it right now. We need it right now. Because there's a desire to be fulfilled. But it's also, the Zohar said, from Bayratsu, and they appeased him. Why is that so important? Appeasing in Hebrew is also Leratzot, coming from the same source, same Shoresh. When we speak about God desire, of course that the creator has no desire because he needs nothing. He is the endless light. He misses nothing. He has a lack for nothing. You know, what can he lack to for if he is everything? He can't desire anything we have. You know, that's why people think, you know, you bring offerings to God. Maybe it will satisfy him. Are you kidding? He is the endless light. Whatever you're bringing, he has already. It's already his, by the way. Okay, so what can he give him? You can't give him. What you can give him is giving yourself as being the place that that light can dwell in. How? When you bring together the spiritual world and the physical world. The whole story of Hanukkah is about that. That from God's point of view, from the creator point of view, desire means, what is a desire? The will of the creator is to share good. Who are we? Our creature, the creatures. We are those creatures who were created to receive that goodness. How can we receive that goodness as Rabbi Ashlag? By desiring it. How do you know you should desire it? You had it before. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And there was a night. There was a day. One day. Night, what did we say? Night is a time of lack. Day, time of light. One day, it was all one. The light and the vessel. The giving of the creator and the reception of the creatures. One day. Oh yes, we didn't like it. We wanted to earn it. So everything had to be separated the next day. And we started the journey of creating the situations in which we invite that light in. The darkness is ours, we created it, so we can invite the light in, that we can choose bringing the light in. How do we choose to bring the light in? By occupying ourselves in the Torah, 
during darkness. Instead of allowing the left column, the angel of death, the body needs and desires take over with fear, lust, uh, greed, uh, anger, hatred, blame, uh, victimization, all of that stuff that's coming from the body, that's coming from the angel of death, that's coming from the left column that is not controlled by the right column, okay? Again, let's go back to the word the word say. From the, it's like there are two meanings to the word the word say. One means I desire, I want. One means to satiate somebody else, to appease somebody else, to bring uh, happiness to somebody else. How could it be the same word? It's exactly the two opposites. No, it's not. It's the two sides of the same thing. Whatever we desire to receive, how do we know we desire it? Because the creator created us to desire it. So from his point of view, that's his giving. From our point of view, that's our receiving. So when we receive just because we want it and we care about nothing, that's a left column. That's always limited instant gratification, and it comes to its demise very soon. But when we create by the law of affinity, chesed and kindness, in spite and because everything around us is dark, everything is negative, we create the illumination by creating an affinity to the light of God. We appease the universe. We appease the world by, by realizing that it's all about the light. And that's why the Zohar says, when we go back to the words, uh, okay, verse 14 again. Vaishlach paro vaikra et Yosef. And the Zohar says, it says Vaika et Yosef. It doesn't say Vaika le Yosef. Who called Joseph? Who appeased him? Vayiritsu Mabo. Who rushed him from the pit? Joseph knew that it's not Pharaoh. It's not his slaves. It was the Creator. He knew that everything is from the Creator. We can see it at the end of the book of Genesis. At the end, the brothers are coming from the funeral of Jacob in Hebron. They come to Joseph and they say, Father, Jacob, before he died, he told us to tell you, to ask you to forgive us for selling you as a slave. And Joseph said, you kidding? You had a bad intention. But God had a good intention, which means, who did it? Who made you sell me as a slave? Who made you almost kill me? God did it. Why? Because otherwise, he said, we will all be right now starving to death in Canaan. Instead, I came to Egypt. I came to power, whatever I went through, and now we can sit and enjoy a good life while the rest of the world is starving. Don't you see it's all God's doings? Which means Joseph, the moment Joseph did not think that is anything that happens that is not from the creator, the moment he knew that if the wine spirit remembers or doesn't remember, that's God's doings. It's only when he's ready. That every, what the Talmud is saying, a person has to see himself. Like the whole world was created for himself. Like I have to see that the whole world was created for me by God. And whatever happens relatively to me, God is doing that to bring me to the best place I need in order to achieve my callings. Everything has happened just because of me. I have to see myself that I am in the center 
of the world. At the same time, I have to see myself that I was created in order to serve the whole world. Why? Because if I'm not here to create chesed and loving kindness, how would I connect to that endless power of the creator, the power of life? So it is confusing, but it's not. If you realize that two aspects to everything, whatever happens, happens for one reason. It happens to bring each one of us to that magical place that we realize, we understand that it's all happening for us. Whatever even looks like a disaster, it's all for the good. Sooner or later, we see it as we realize that the desire of the creator to give us joy, pleasure, fulfillment is so much greater than our desire to receive. But only when we bring that chesed, every moment of unconditional love to people, to the creatures of the universe, to the creator, to the creation, only then comes the moment that we realize that everything that happens to us is just, to, just for us just for our good. And by doing that, by bring, coming to that state of mind, we unite the heaven and the earth. We bring the bride and the groom together. We create harmony. And that harmony affects the rest of the world. Lighting the Hanukkah candles is that we have the power to make us understand that we have the power to bring that light from above and make the light shine from below. This is the secret of Hanukkah. And only a candle. And by doing that, we can receive endless fulfillment that it's much more from gold, diamonds, any pleasure that the physical world can have for us. And when we understand that, the, the negativity, the pain, the suffering will be eliminated at once. And we'll see how the whole world is imbued, full of heavenly light and positivity. And that's the goal of Hanukkah. And that's the goal of everything we should do every day in our lives. Thank you so much. Happy Hanukkah.